Deep in the heart of Texas stands the cultural center of the Southwest, Dallas, Big D. This futuristic skyline is a perfect backdrop for one of the most successful franchises in all of pro sports, the Dallas Cowboys. Since 1960, these Cowboys have established an NFL tradition that glistens with excitement. This team has marched through nearly three decades armed with a confidence that comes from knowing great players make great plays. In the summer of 1987, the Dallas Times Herald conducted a poll of their readers to find the greatest moments in Dallas Cowboy history. Cowboy and loving the cowboy ways, pursuing the life of my high riding heroes. I burned up my childhood days. Since 1960, the Dallas Cowboys have fielded a unique NFL team that has fought to become a consistent winner and an exciting champion. Big play, Stabler to throw, here comes the pressure. Shot! And the end zone! Football! Football! It is a touchdown! A touchdown! Ah! Randy White balls Stabler and the ball came loose! You gotta believe it! My heroes have always been cowboys And they still are unseen Sadly in search of one step and back on themselves and their slow moving dreams. Cowboys are special, cowboys are special, cowboys are special, cowboys are special. Dallas Cowboys are special indeed. What began as a woeful expansion team has developed into an American sports institution. The Cowboys are to football what the Celtics are to basketball and the Yankees to baseball. And their heroes are many. Bob Lilly, number 74, was the Cowboys' first draft choice in 1961. He was all pro seven times and the first Dallas Cowboy to be enshrined in the Pro Football Hall of Fame. Bob Lilly was a gifted athlete. He was a player that was uh, so superior to the people around him. The guy had strength, he had quickness. It took two or three guys to block him. The best player I ever coached. The play of this gentle giant symbolized both the dreams and frustrations of the Dallas franchise during the 60s. Each season from 1966 to 1970 ended in bitter playoff losses that cast Lilly and the Cowboys as next year's champions. It was a tag that number 74 refused to accept.
After an agonizing loss to the Colts in Super Bowl V, Lily and the Cowboys rolled back to Super Bowl VI, armed with an obsession for winning a world championship. Lily let everyone know uh, that we, uh, we came very close the year before and we, we blew it. He just uh, really came into that game with a lot of determination. Lily Spark ignited a team that burned up five years of frustration against the Miami Dolphins. Lily and veterans like number 54 Chuck Howley and Leroy Jordan number 55 paced a doomsday defense that allowed only a field goal. Dwayne Thomas number 33 rushed for one touchdown while the game's MVP Roger Staubach number 12 passed for two more. However, one special play would symbolize the end of the Cowboys championship frustrations. Whenever you mention that football game, they don't really mention any of the touchdowns, they don't mention any of the other plays. They always mention Bob Lilly chasing Bob Greasy. It had a finality to it that when they chased him and ran him down and trapped him back there, that just seemed to be the football game. It was like herding cattle. You know, Bob on one side, I think Larry Cole on the other. It's like two cutting horses working on a calf. And they just kept running him back and back and back. Well, Kelly got 29 yards back and they dumped him. Well, it was, it was a highlight of the day. That seemed to, to ensure that we were probably going to win that football game on that particular play. When you see somebody chasing somebody that far back, and that's probably the longest lost yardage situation I've ever seen in football. But uh, it, it just gave you great confidence. It was a great day for our team because we were the team that couldn't win the big one. Dallas Cowboys, bridesmaids at the NFL. That was a tag that we heard everywhere we went. It was every paper, bridesmaids. I think when we won the Super Bowl of beating Miami, that that was like somebody lifted off a 100-pound weight off all of us. I saw the Lilies and the Renfros and the Greens and the Jordans and the Neelys and the old timers that were there, Rayfield Wright and Bob Hayes and guys that had, in, had been fighting the good fight in the late 60s. The feeling they had, I, I don't think is, I've never had anything to fulfill that, uh, even another Super Bowl after that first one. And I can picture in my mind today the picture of Bob Lilly in the locker room after we won the Super Bowl with Miami. Him sitting there in his sweaty Dallas Cowboy shirt smoking a cigar and a big old smile on his face. However, the biggest smile of the day was worn by head coach Tom Landry, who had finally taken the Cowboys from expansion to a world championship. Tom Landry is the only head coach the Dallas Cowboys have ever known. Go! Dallas Cowboys! In 1960, when the NFL awarded an expansion franchise to owner Clint Murchison Jr., general manager Tech Schramm's first move was to lure young Tom Landry away from the New York Giants to become the head coach of the Dallas Cowboys. Time has proven that it was a brilliant decision, but it seemed as though Landry's first Cowboys were destined for failure. We were a team that was not, uh, was made up of just 36 players that came off of a, of a expansion. We had no draft or anything, and so we were a team that was pretty inept at that time, as you might say. But we played a great game in that first game. Against the Pittsburgh Steelers, about 30,000 curious fans dotted the Cotton Bowl and watched number 14, quarterback Eddie LeBaron, throw for 345 yards as the Cowboys rolled up 28 points. This night, however, the doomsday defense was still only a dream in Tom Landry's mind as the Steelers outscored the Cowboys in a wild shootout. Back in those days, everything was exciting, even losses, because we were starting, we were struggling, and every day was a, was a new experience. Obviously, when you're starting a new football team, you're looking for the first win, and the first year that 
eluded us. That year when we got a tie, that was a big accomplishment. That was the same as one of the biggest victories that we might have had in a Super Bowl or anything because we had finally done something other than lose. And then the next year we got our first win. Dallas Cowboys, who failed to find victory in their first NFL season, opened their second with a tough assignment. The Pittsburgh Steelers. Little Eddie LeBaron enters the game and works a little razzle-dazzle with Amos Marsh. Eddie finally fires to Billy Houghton at the goal line and Billy trots across. The incomparable Bobby Lane gets his wing warmed up for the Steelers. Bobby hits Buddy Dial and his Cowboy defender bites the dust as Dial dashes in to score. Their 24-17 lead looks good, but with 56 seconds left, Eddie LeBaron hits Dick Bielski right at the goal line and ties everything up tight at 24 apiece. Interception with about 20 seconds left gives LeBaron another chance. The little general jars the Steelers with a 41-yard pitch to Billy Houghton. With one second on the clock, Alan Green toes home a 27-yard field goal to give the Dallas Cowboys their first National Football League victory. A final second. Come from behind as we did in that football game and win the game. That was a great thrill, of course, that could never be repeated because it was number one. After you've gone 0, 11, and 1, it's pretty exciting to win one. But uh, that was a big victory for us as a team because your first one always was exciting. Tom Landry's initial victory as head coach was the first step of a journey that would lead to the pinnacle of pro football. His system has been perpetuated throughout the NFL by many of his former players. But nearing his third decade, he remains unique and the man behind every great moment in Dallas Cowboy history. Philadelphia fighting back. King Hill, the quarterback, looking for McDonald. Mike Geckner with the steal. He can fly. 20, 30. Geckner is gone. 100 yards, and the Cowboys score again. From the beginning, Landry stressed each phase of the Cowboy assault. The cards, Jim Backen, is short on a field goal try. That's Jerry Norton scooping it up at the six-yard line. He runs through a whole flock of birds in the first ten yards and is off on a 94-yard return. It's the first touchdown return of an attempted field goal in Cowboys history. Throughout the 1960s, the Cowboys improved under the unflappable direction of Tom Landry. Yet even his emotions were severely tested by a string of monumental frustrations that marked Dallas's inability to win an NFL championship. But while Landry suffered in silence, his patience finally paid off in 1970 with the Cowboys' first NFC championship. Landry's first title would be followed by many more, yet this one will always be something special. Boy, it feels, you can't imagine how it feels, because you never met, you never suffered with us like we've suffered, you know, in those losses in the last four years. It's a great reward for these fellows who worked so hard to get there. Once the Cowboys achieved a championship level, Landry's doomsday defense kept them there. He is the constant in a defense where the players change while the punishing results remain the same.
Landry's defenders have always believed that the football is the property of the man holding it at the end of the play, not the beginning. In Super Bowl 13, Thomas Henderson and Mike Heckman, number 58, combined for some larceny that netted the Cowboys a touchdown. In 1975, Charlie Waters, number 41, finished off the Redskins with an interception return that secured a wild card playoff spot for the Cowboys. Through the years, the Dallas defense has won many championships. With the Eastern Division title on the line in 1985, Ed Too Tall Jones, number 72, and Jim Jeffcoat, number 77, combined to stop a New York Giant comeback. We were in what we call a 61 defense. Ed was coming in more of a power pass rush, and Ed fortunately got in front of Phil Sims, and he deflected it. And I saw the ball still in the air, so, so I just reached for it and ran for daylight. Jeff Coates' alert play proved to be the difference in a 28-21 victory that secured the division title. Doomsday's most dominating performance occurred in Super Bowl XII. Randy White, number 54, and Harvey Martin, number 79, powered a cowboy defense that buried the Denver Broncos. Dallas rolled onto their second world championship as Landry's intricate offense delivered some truly great moments. A three-man rush again. Roger goes deep across the middle. Way downfield and touchdown is caught! Touchdown! A sensational diving catch by Buck Johnson, the Cowboys, second-year wide receiver. In the third quarter, Butch Johnson's acrobatic catch put the game out of Denver's reach. And in the final period, Landry's imagination clinched his second NFL title. I don't know why, uh, Vern, but I just have the feeling that uh, Tom Landry might have a gadget that he might want to use in a situation like this somewhere here. One of those trick plays. Pitch <laughs> out, Newhouse goes left, pulls up, wants the pass. Fires it deep for goalie Richard. Like Butch Johnson's spectacular catch earlier, there simply was no adequate defense for Robert Newhouse's accurate pass and Golden Richards' remarkable catch. As the clock wound down on this New Orleans Super Sunday, Randy White and Harvey Martin joined former Cowboy Chuck Howley as the only defensive players to be named the MVP of the Super Bowl. In Super Bowl XII, millions of fans were offered yet another useful lesson in Tom Landry's style of winning. It's a proven formula that is as entertaining as the Cowboy players are exciting. Three of the NFL's most electrifying athletes have played for the Dallas Cowboys. Tony Dorsett, Herschel Walker, and Bullet Bob Hayes. Bob Hayes brought to the Cowboys, you know, something that uh, most teams dearly like to have, and that was super speed. Bob had it. And consequently, with you know, the long bomb, he was always a threat in any particular ball game that he played in. Bob Hayes' ability to run past people changed the entire game of football because they had put people out to cover these receivers man to man. And all of a sudden, they found out they couldn't do that with Bob Hayes. After winning a gold medal in the 1964 Olympics and setting the world's record in the 100-yard dash, Bob Hayes joined the Dallas Cowboys in 1965. During the next nine years, he scored 71 touchdowns, which is a Cowboys receiving record that still stands to this day. A 
against Washington in 1966, Hayes combined with Dandy Don Meredith for a single game receiving record 246 yards. That total included a 95-yard touchdown reception that set still another Cowboy record. This cross-country sprint put the Cowboys back in a game they would win in the closing seconds and was but one of many electrifying moments by the bullet. Like Bob Hayes, Herschel Walker, number 34, is primarily a football player and, incidentally, a sprinter. At 6'1", 225 pounds, his size and world-class speed make him a game-breaker, a fact he demonstrated in his very first game as a cowboy in 1986. To be honest with you, I really wasn't sure what I was doing. It was a play call, and I really was not sure of the blocking scheme because I only had such a short time of training camp. And after Danny handed the ball off to me, I just started reading. And after I got through the uh, front line, I knew then that I could score. Walker's touchdown, with barely a minute to play, gave Dallas a 31-28 victory over the Giants. And later, he would total 292 yards running and receiving against the Eagles. While this electric cowboy made some plays to remember, it will be a few years before he has created as many great moments as Tony Dorsett. Hands it off to Dorsett, into the secondary, to the 30, 35, to the 40, catch right, watch out! To the 50, the 40, he's to the 30, the 20, the 10, the 5, Tony Dorsett, touchdown! Toughness and durability, as much as a knack for breaking long runs, have made Tony Dorsett the Cowboys' all-time leading rusher. He's been, surprisingly enough, he's a better north-south runner than he is east-west runner. Uh, he has great feel and recognition when he heads into the line as an inside runner. But you don't think about him being an inside runner because he only weighs 190 pounds. But it's his great acceleration and speed that makes him what he is today. things that I do, the God-given talents that I have, I think people kind of take them for granted. People kind of say, well, that's, that's just Dorsett, you know, that's just his way of doing things. The handoff goes to Dorsett, dances into the secondary and heads left. The 30 comes right to the 50, to the 40. He's going to score an 84-yard touchdown. Tony Dorsett, 84 yards on the touchdown. I didn't come into this business being a bulldog type of runner. I'm a runner that you, your grandmother, or someone else could probably enjoy watching because I'm, it's something exciting that's possible to happen at any time on the field. Dallas is 99 yards and two feet away from the Minnesota goal line. Goal line defense for the Vikings. A handoff door set up the middle. Here he goes. Cuts to his right. He's going all the way. Here go. To the 30. To the 40. He's got two men to beat. To the 40. To the 30. To the 20, to the 10, the 5, touchdown! Yeah! Unbelievable! Tony Dorsett is in the record books, 99 yards. All I know is we ended up with the ball on the inch yard line, if anything such as possible. I was on the sideline, and a play was called uh, H31, which is just a straight dive up the middle. And... Uh, Someone yelled to me to go in and get Ron Springs out of the ball game. So I ran in uh, yelling, Ron, Ron, come out, come out. And when he left, that left us with 10 men on the field. It was just a straight dive play up the middle. I, I went up the middle. I read Tom Rafferty's block on, on the nose guard there and come up through the hole, made a cut. It's going down the right sideline there. And, and I, there was two defenders along with Drew Pearson. And I'm struggling. I'm looking at Drew's legs, and I see his legs are looking a little weary. I'm tiring somewhat myself, so at that time, I decided to go around Drew, and that defender, he hit me, but he didn't hit me enough to knock me out of bounds, and it ended up in a 99-yard touchdown. Of course, at that time, I was not aware that it was an NFL record. We were just trying to get back in the ball game. It just happened to be a great play with just 10 men on the field. 
Tony Dorsett, an electric cowboy with a record-setting flair for the dramatic. When Drew Pearson, number 88, joined the Cowboys as a free agent wide receiver in 1973, he seemed destined for greatness. Drew is a winner. I mean, he's got the intangibles of, of when it's a big play, he's at his best, or when it's a critical situation, he's at his best. Staubach first discovered Drew's big play talent in the 1973 playoffs. Clinging to a one-point lead over the Rams, Dallas was pinned deep in their own territory until Drew Pearson performed his special brand of magic. Pearson's 83-yard touchdown sent the Cowboys on to the NFC Championship and was the beginning of a game-winning combination. Drew just had that special sense of making things happen when it counted, and, uh, and I realized it, uh, and, and it was better for me. You know, he got me in the Hall of Fame <laughs> with those catches that he made. He was just that great of a player. I think it's the intangibles in people that make the difference, and, and, and that's what you can't read on the computers. And that's why the computer kept spitting Drew Pearson out, because they didn't read those intangibles, and, and, and that's heart, or, or whatever you want to call it. You know, if you just go through his career, when you look at critical catches, Drew Pearson, I probably made more than any receiver that's ever played the game. Roger back to throw, he goes deep for Drew Pearson. Pearson at the one yard line, and has a touchdown! Pearson's gift was that even when everyone in the stadium knew that the ball was going to him, he still got open and made the catch. This inspired confidence in every quarterback he played with and produced many great moments. In 1974, the Cowboys were on the ropes against the arch-rival Redskins, who were just 28 seconds away from a 23-17 knockout. They knocked Starbuck at the, out of the game, and here comes Clint Longley, and you can see all the Redskins on the sideline cheering and everything, thinking they got the game won. And you see George Allen licking his thumb and everything. He's, he's got this one in the bag. Roger Starbuck and company. Roger Starbuck, Tom Landry, Tex Ram. Here we go. With Starbuck out, Dallas's fortunes rode on the untested arm of a rookie. But fortunately for Tom Landry, the Cowboys still had Drew Pearson. Pearson's 50-yard reception defied logic, yet breathtaking performances like these were his trademark. In the huddle, I said, Clint, we got to go deep. He says, fine, go deep. Just ran again a turn and takeoff route and was able to get by the defender on the play and Clint could really throw it a mile. And he just laid it out there and I just ran to it and I uh, was able to make the play. I don't think uh, you can ever perform in those situations unless you dream of yourself being in those situations. As you're a kid, you always dream of yourself catching the winning touchdown. Uh, before a game, I would always envision myself making the big play, pulling the game out, winning the game, and fortunately, it happened quite a few times for me. Drew Pearson's ability to make Dallas's dreams come true was further evidenced in a 1980 playoff game in Atlanta. Trailing by two touchdowns with barely six minutes remaining, the Cowboys were in trouble. Danny White, number 11, had replaced the retired Roger Staubach at quarterback. And like the man he replaced, in the crunch, White looked for Drew Pearson. I was scrambling, and Drew was, was deep in the end zone, and I tried to get him to move, 
by pointing as I was scrambling. And when I pointed, all the defensive backs moved, but Drew didn't. He, he stayed in place, and I threw the ball into the middle of about three defensive backs, and Drew out-jumped him and came down with the ball. It was a remarkable catch. Pearson's spectacular stilled a once-deafening Atlanta crowd who suddenly sensed that their team was about to fall victim to another Cowboy comeback. Here come the Cowboys, still with 49 seconds to go. Ball at the 23, 27, 24. Danny White with one running back. Here comes the blitz again. Danny back to throw into the end zone. Caught! Touchdown! Drew Pearson, the Cowboys wide receiver. Drew Pearson's ability to pull off the unbelievable produced some of the greatest moments in Cowboy history. However, no player ever authored more dramatic last-second heroics than the Cowboys' Captain Comeback. Okay, everybody ready? Let's go. Red right. Power 49 near Geo. It's on two. It's on two. Ready? Break. After winning the Heisman Trophy at the Naval Academy and serving four years of military duty, Roger Staubach joined the Dallas Cowboys in 1969 as a 27-year-old rookie. He soon became the hub around which the franchise revolved. By the time he retired in 1979, number 12 was the NFL's top-ranked passer of all time. And the Cowboys had won two Super Bowls. But the definitive fact about Roger Staubach is that he loved to play in the clutch. 23 times, he generated come-from-behind victories in the fourth quarter, 14 of them in the final two minutes or in overtime. Staubach's choir boy image belied his passion to compete with little thought for his personal safety. Staubach made the Dallas Cowboys dangerous no matter what the circumstances were. I think the biggest thing about Roger was the fact that he never quit. It didn't matter how much the Cowboys were down. I remember in, in uh, San Francisco, they were ahead of us 14 or 15 points, and it was three minutes to go or something, and they were coming by our bench and hollering obscene things at us and talk, calling us losers. They laughed at us. They were making fun of us during the game because yeah, they were really enjoying having the upper hand on us. They didn't think there was any way because our offense was sputtering. We were doing absolutely nothing. And then Coach Lander decides to put Roger in, and I tell you, it was like a 180-degree turnaround in offense. We went to Gresson's and Roger for some balls between linebackers that, that had the velocity that, that the receiver better catch it. It was he was going to be injured if he didn't catch it. Starback to Billy Parks pulled the Cowboys to within five points. But with barely a minute remaining, Dallas still needed the ball back. We had this uh, foreign kicker from Austria, Tony Fritz, he used to try all these tricky uh, ways of uh, kicking the ball. And he used to do this thing where he'd run up to the ball and run past it, and he'd kick it behind his back. So we got on the field and they said it was going to be an onside kick to the right. And when Tony went up to the ball, it looked like from San Francisco's point of view that the ball was going to be to the left. But when he crossed over, he went past the ball and then kicked with his left foot behind him. And it tricked him just enough for us to, to get the jump on the ball and Mel recovered, Mel Renfro recovered it. Once we got that onside kick, the, the, it definitely, the momentum turned. We got the ball back uh, on the onside kick, and you know, I scrambled for a first down and hit another pass to Parks, and it was the most unbelievable comeback because we were totally out of it. It wasn't even a, there wasn't even a pulse at one time during that game that we were going to win that game, and to turn it around, that's why you had such an emotional situation from our players because it really was a game that, unless you were just the most unbelievable believer, that you didn't think we were coming back. It was 
was the beginning time for the great comebacks that Roger is so well known for throughout his career. When we won that game against San Francisco, from that moment on, we always believed that we could win the ball game. Staubach's message was clear. Don't give up the ship. And with number 12 at the helm, the Cowboys sailed through the 70s full speed ahead. Roger Staubach was an officer and a gentleman, an all-American hero you respected and admired, and whose friend you longed to be. Roger Staubach would be what every parent wanted their son to be. He is the epitome of a gentleman. He's the epitome of a guy who, who, who commits himself to a cause. Uh, I've got more respect for him as an athlete than anybody I've ever played with or coached. I just don't know, of all the years I played, I just don't know of any player that I played with that disliked Roger Staubach. There's certain guys you look at that you've played against, and uh, I'm proud to tell my kids I played against Roger Staubach. Staubach's cowboy career was punctuated by many gallant last gasp rallies. But against the Redskins in his final regular season game, Staubach wrote a script that had more drama than a Hollywood thriller. That was probably the best game that Roger ever played for us because the odds were so much against us, even more than it was back in the 49er game. He had to bring our club back against a very fine Redskin team that really had us on the ropes. From the beginning to the end, it was comebacks by both teams. And uh, we came back 21-17 and looked like we had total control of the game. And then all of a sudden, we, had, we didn't have any control of the game. Theismann, delay, play to Riggins, coming to the right side, and Riggins has a big hole, first down, down the sideline, 40, 30, he's gone to the 20, the 10, he's still on his feet, touchdown, and that may be more than the Cowboys can overcome. I was recording the game with KRLD as a guest broadcaster that day, and in my heart, I believed that the Cowboys were going to win the game, and... and my announcer, the co-announcer with me, Brad Shim, kept saying, hey, Charlie, there's no way. The game's over. So, Brad, hey, you got to believe that this team can win. We always believe that if we could just get the ball back to Roger somehow. Clock is running. 2.38 left in the game. Can it happen again? Can they come back again? Shotgun formation. Staubach looking into the face of a four-man rush. Throwing. Caught. Spring. Go. Touchdown! Touchdown, Rod Spring! 2.20 left in the game. Can they do it again? you got to believe, Brad. Woo! With barely a minute remaining, the Cowboys needed the ball back and stirred by the inspirational play of Captain Comeback, veteran Larry Cole, number 63, stopped the Redskins dead in their tracks. Larry Cole stopped uh, John Riggins on a third and two play to turn over the possession to the Cowboys. The school was out. It was, it was going to happen, and I think everybody in the stadium knew it. A minute one left in the game. This is an all-timer. When Roger got in that situation, he was going to win it for you, and, and everybody felt he was going to win that one. Cowboys at the Redskin 33. Second down, 10. From the shotgun. Staubach has time, throws, caught, Preston You gotta love them. I mean, you gotta love the Cowboys. They're the most exciting team in the NFL. They can pull it out. 42 seconds left in the game. Redskins lead by six. How can you live like this, doing this every oh, week? This is what it's all about. This is a killer. Second down and eight from the eight-yard line. No shotgun this time. Staubach throwing in the end zone. Tony Hill, touchdown, Tony Hill. Oh, the stadium goes wild. Charlie Waters goes wild. 
It was one of those routine Starbucks spectaculars. Simply the impossible may come true. There was none better at that. The Cowboys have won the East. The Cowboys have come from behind twice. Unbelievably. I ain't never seen nothing like this. Just another day at the office, Brad. Yeah, just, you know. <laughs> it proved to be the last hurrah for this legendary Dallas Cowboy. The system was successful before me. It's been successful in the 70s with me, and it'll be successful without me. The system is not impersonal at all. It's a bunch of people that know what they're doing. All the way from Clint down to Tex, who really runs the ball club, and of course the nuts and bolts of the Dallas Cowboys is, uh... <coughs> a man that wears a funny hat on the sidelines. I wasn't going to do this, but uh, Tom Landry is the nuts and bolts, and I appreciate him. I appreciate my teammates through the years, because I'm one that's been successful in this system. It's been a lot of good ones. Roger Staubach left many behind parties. many great memories, and one of them would be remembered as the greatest moment in Dallas Cowboy history. In 1975, the Dallas Cowboys were a team in transition. There were 12 rookies on the squad, and many so-called experts predicted that the Cowboy mystique would crumble. It was a year that we weren't expected to do anything. The previous year had been the first year we'd been out of the playoffs in many years. We had lost a large number of our more famous players, such as Bob Lilly, and we were kind of looked upon as rebuilding, as that famous word. However, Dallas Cowboys don't rebuild, they reload. Tom Landry brought the shotgun formation back from the early 60s, and with Roger Staubach at the trigger, Dallas attacked the NFL with fresh ideas and enthusiastic new talent. Defensively, it was doomsday in diapers, as youthful exuberance made up for inexperience. This team had an exciting way of turning impending disaster into touchdowns. Though they were unable to win the Eastern Division, their 10-4 record earned these young Cowboys a wild-card playoff berth. They certainly were not a division favorite before the year began. They had the Dirty Dozen, and they did it by hope and by, by prayer and by Hail Mary. Against Minnesota in the first round of the playoffs, the high-flying Cowboys finally came crashing to earth. Dallas struggled from the start, and the Vikings took a late fourth quarter lead. It was a very frustrating day for me because we're here we are in the last quarter losing in the playoff game. I hadn't caught any passes, had one ball thrown, so I was mad at Staubach, I was mad at Landry, I was mad at our whole offense, I was mad at everybody. It was even a more hopeless situation than, than Roger Staubach was accustomed to rescuing. And this was a very, very good Minnesota team. Some people thought perhaps the, their best team of all, better than any that got the Super Bowl. I hate to admit it, but uh, I, had, I didn't think we had any chance to win the Minnesota game because we just hadn't played well, that well all day. And what we had to do in that last time against a great prevent type of defense they played, the three deep receivers, I said that we don't have time to do it. With no timeouts, Dallas moved from their own nine yard line as Staubach finally located Drew Pearson for two completions. But just when hopes were rising, the Cowboys shotgun backfired. We were first year with the shotgun. John Fitzgerald had hurt his arm, and John snapped the ball, was rolling on the ground, and I was chasing it around, and I said, gee, this could be a long drive here. We, 
we got into like a fourth and 18 situation and uh, Drew came back to the huddle. I said, Drew, what, what can you do? And he said, I think I can go to the corner on right. I said, well, make a good post move, though. You got to get him turned and break back to the corner and uh, make sure you get 18 yards. And that was really a key play. We got, we got the first down. The Cowboys were still alive, while the Vikings were simply kicking. Now at midfield, Staubach turned to Preston Pearson, who dropped the pass. Ironically, it proved to be a reprieve that set the stage for the greatest moment in Dallas Cowboys history. And then we came back and I said, Drew, can you run an in route like you did to beat Washington, which was actually in 1974, uh, and then break it deep? And he said, yeah, he said, I'll run an in route, which is our favorite route, which is a deep, what we call a 16 route. And I said, act like you're running an in route, just don't try to run by him. And then kind of break deep and I'll pump, uh, get Krause, I'll keep Krause away from, them, from getting over to you. And that's all we did. And I just told everybody else, don't worry about it, I'm gonna throw it to Drew. Well, the Cowboys need a miracle. Roger takes the snap, pumps it once. He's going long, down the near sideline for Drew Pearson. Pearson makes the catch at the five, touchdown! Staubach hit Pearson on a 50-yard touchdown. Would you believe it? What happened on that Hail Mary play, I think the blessing to the whole play was that Staubach underthrew uh, me on the play. I pumped uh, to the left to keep uh, Kraus. Kraus really could have made the play if I hadn't pumped to the left. And that really held him up for a second. And then Drew got outside of right, and the ball was underthrown. By me pumping, Drew really got down the field a little bit too far. So we were running downfield, and I looked back, and I saw that the ball was underthrown. And I was able to put on the brakes and come back. Nate fell down, and I thought I had dropped the ball. It hit my hands, and I thought I had dropped it. And I was bent over, and it was stuck between my elbow and my hip. I couldn't believe when I had the ball, and the fans in Minnesota, of course, couldn't believe it either. It's funny how things change because that last uh, drive, uh, 91 yards we needed for the, that last touchdown, and I ended up catching the four passes in that drive for a total of 91 yards, and of course the Hail Mary. The stadium was stunned. I mean, I've never been in a stadium that was so quiet. It was a weird moment, and I think that particular play was, was the biggest single play that I've ever been a part of. It changed a whole season, and it got us back to a Super Bowl when we needed to get back in 1975 on our comeback for the late 70s for the Cowboys. After the game, Roger Staubach said that he simply threw the ball to Drew and yelled, Hail Mary. This prayer of a pass will forever be remembered as the greatest moment in Dallas Cowboys history. In the years to come, the Cowboys will enjoy more moments of greatness and will continue to build on their winning tradition. But the heroes of the future will have a difficult standard of excellence to match and an almost impossible one to better.